Why faith is compared to a shield is the question we address today. The apostle compares faith to a shield because of a double resemblance between this grace and that particular piece of armor. The first likeness is that the shield is not for the defense of any one part of the body, as most other pieces are. The helmet is fitted for the head, and the plate designed for the breast, but the shield is intended for the defense of the whole body. Therefore it was to be made very large, and was called a a gate or door, because it was so long and large that it covered the whole body. The psalmist alludes to this meaning when he says, Thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield. And if the shield was not large enough to cover every part at once, the skillful soldier could turn it this way or that way to stop the swords or the arrows, no matter where they were directed. This resemblance reminds us of the importance of faith in the life of a Christian. It defends the whole man. Every part of the Christian is preserved by it. Sometimes the temptation is leveled at the head, at the saint's reasoning. Satan will dispute truth, and if he can, will make a Christian question the validity of faith merely because his understanding cannot comprehend it. And sometimes he prevails, blotting out a person's beliefs in the deity of Christ and in other great and profound truths of the gospel. But faith intervenes between the believer and this arrow, coming to the relief of the Christian's weak understanding. Abraham, being not weak in faith, considered not his own body now dead, Romans 4.19. If reason had had the upper hand in that business, if that holy man had put the promise to a test of sense and reason, he would have been in danger of questioning the truth of it, although God himself was the messenger. But faith brought him through the test. I will trust the word of God, says the believer, not my own blind reason. Again, it is conscience that the tempter assaults. Well, Satan often shoots his fiery darts of horror and terror at this mark. But faith can endure the shock. David says, I had fainted unless I had believed. When false witnesses rose up against him and breathed out cruelty, faith was his best defense against man's accusations. And so it is against Satan's charge and consciences also. Never was a man in a sadder condition than the Philippian jailer. The only thing that kept him from suicide was the strong determination of his prisoners, who, having seen him fall at the feet of Paul and Silas with the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? would have thought this deep wound to his conscience could so soon be closed and healed. The earthquake of horror, which had so dreadfully shaken his conscience, was quiet, and his trembling turned into rejoicing. Notice what it was that caused such a blessed calm. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, in verse 31. And he rejoiced, believing in God with all his house, verse 34. Faith stilled the storm which sin had raised. It was faith that changed his grief into joy and gladness. That story is found in Acts chapter 16. Again, it is the will that temptation tries to snare some time, or some of God's commands cannot be obeyed without self-denial, because they cross us in circumstances where our wills adamantly desire to rule. Thus, we must deny our own wills before we can do God's will. Now a temptation becomes very forceful when it runs with the tide of our human wills. What? says Satan. Will you serve a God who thwarts you in everything? It seems that God always asks you to give up what you love the most. No lamb in all the flock would serve for a sacrifice, but Isaac, Isaac would, Abraham's only child. God was not content until Abraham served him in a place of banishment from his closest friends and family. 
Will you yield to such hard terms as these, Satan taunted? Now faith is the grace which serves the soul admirably during such a crisis as this. It is able to still the tumult which temptation stirs in the soul, and finally to dismiss all thoughts of mutiny. And further, faith can keep the king of heaven's peace so sweetly in the Christian's heart that such a temptation, when it comes, finds nothing to welcome it. By faith, it is written, Abraham obeyed and went out, not knowing where he went, Hebrews 11.8. And we do not read of a single wistful look he cast back toward his native country, because faith had made him satisfied with his path. It was hard work for Moses to strip himself of the magistrate's robes and allow someone else to take over his work and reap the honor of planting the Israelites' colors in Canaan after it had cost him so much to bring them within sight of it. Yet faith made him willing. He saw better robes in heaven that he would put on than those he was called to put off on earth. The lowest place in glory is, beyond all compare, greater than the highest place of honor here on earth. For Moses to stand before the throne and minister to God in heaven was more to be desired than to sit on an earthly throne and have all the world bowing at his feet. The second resemblance between faith and a shield is this. Not only does the shield defend the whole body, but it defends the soldier's other armor, too. It keeps the arrow from the helmet, as well as from the head, from both breast and breastplate alike. And thus, faith is armor upon armor, a grace that preserves all the other graces. The next section, the meaning of the expression, above all. There are various views among interpreters as to the meaning of this phrase. Jerome has it meaning in all duties, enterprises, temptations, or afflictions, in whatever you are called to do or suffer, take faith. He's talking about um, Ephesians chapter 6, where where this thing is is talked about, Ephesians 6.16, about using the shield of faith. It says, above all taking the shield of faith. What does he mean by above all? How can the Christian please himself if he does not please God? Well, others interpret the passage like this. Over all, take the shield of faith as that which will cover all your graces. Every grace derives its safety from faith. Each one lies secure under the shadow of faith. As an army is protected under the command of a strong castle fitted with cannon. But let me follow the translation I feel is most comprehensive. Above all, take, that is, among all the pieces of armor which you are to wear for your defense, let this be the one that you propose most earnestly to acquire, and having acquired it, most carefully to keep. But we see then that the apostle compared faith to the shield because he meant to give it preeminence. In old times, the shield was prized by a soldier above all other pieces of armor. He counted it a greater shame to lose his shield than to lose the battle. And therefore he would not part with it even when he was under the very foot of the enemy, but esteemed it an honor to die with his shield in his hand. It was the charge which one mother laid upon her son going into war when she said, either bring your shield home with you or be brought home upon your shield. She would rather have seen her son dead with his shield than alive without it. The apostle further attached another noble effect to faith. We are commanded to take the girdle of truth the breastplate of righteousness, and so on, but it is not specified what each one of them could do. Yet, when the apostle spoke of faith, he ascribed the whole victory to it. This quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked. And why is this true? Are the other graces useless? And does faith do everything? 
If so, why must the Christian arm himself with more than this one piece? I answer that every piece has its vital use in the Christian's warfare. No one part can be spared in the day of battle. But the reason that no single effect is attributed to each of these, but that all is ascribed to faith, is to let us know that these graces, their power and our benefit from them, must operate in conjunction with faith. Plainly, it is the design of God's Spirit to give faith the precedence among all those graces entrusted to our keeping. But be careful not to become indifferent or careless in your dealings with the other graces just because you are more excited about getting and keeping this one. Could we warn a soldier to beware of a wound at his heart but forget to guard his head? Truly, we would deserve cracked crowns to cure us of such foolishness. Now we talk about another point here being begun, the preeminence of faith above other graces. Of all graces, faith is the most important. The Christian must fight to keep it because there is a preeminence peculiar to faith. It is among graces as the sun is among the planets, or as Solomon's virtuous woman among the daughters. In one scripture, the apostle gives precedence to love and sets faith on a lower level. He says, and now abides faith, hope, charity, or love, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Here, his placing of love before faith points to the saint's blissful home in heaven where love remains and faith disappears. In that regard, love is clearly the greater because it is the end of our faith. We see by faith so that we may enjoy by love. Before the Christian can enjoy heaven's rewards, however, he must live in a spiritually militant state here on earth. From this practical perspective, love must give way to faith. It is true, love is the grace which will triumph in heaven, but it is faith, not love, which is the conquering grace on earth. 1 John 5, 4, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Certainly love has its place in battle and contends valiantly, but it moves under faith, its leader. Faith, which works by love, it says in Galatians 5, 6. Even as the captain fights by his soldiers whom he leads, so faith works by the love which it arouses. Love is the grace which ultimately possesses the inheritance, but it is faith that gives the Christian the right to it. Without faith, he could never enjoy it. Love is the grace which unites God and the glorified saints in heaven, but it is faith which first unites them to Christ while they are in the world. Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And if Christ never dwells in them by faith on earth, they can never dwell with God in heaven. Amen.